Okay, I think we can get started. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for coming out and joining us for this session. My name is Ben Green. I'm a postdoctoral scholar in the Michigan Society of Fellows, an assistant professor in the Ford School, and a faculty affiliate of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program at the University of Michigan. The Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program, also known as STPP, is an interdisciplinary university-wide program dedicated to training students, uh, conducting cutting edge research and informing the public and policymakers on issues at the intersection of technology, science, ethics, society, and public policy. One of the few silver linings of the pandemic is that people can join our events from anywhere. So for those of you interested in learning more about our STPP program, you can do so at our website, stpp.fordschool.umich.edu. Before I introduce today's speaker, I wanna make a couple of announcements. First, for those of you interested in the STPP Graduate Certificate Program, the next application deadline is in the new year on March 1st. Second, our next STPP webinar will be on Monday, February 8th at 4 p.m. I, Ben Green, will be giving a talk called Algorithmic Realism, Expounding the Boundaries of Algorithmic Thought. If you're interested in attending, you can register at the link in the chat. I'm very excited about today's event, Digital Contact Tracing, an unlikely policy story, and to welcome our guest, Erin Simpson. Ms. Simpson is the Associate Director of the Center for American Progress, uh, where she is working towards an open, generative, rights-respecting internet and effective democratic regulatory infrastructure. Simpson served as the Civil Society Lead for the Computational Propaganda Research Project at the University of Oxford where she supported international civil and human rights leaders in preparing for disinformation and advocated for improved platform regulation in the European Union, United Kingdom, and United States. She was the founding director of programs at Civic Hall Labs and a Microsoft Tech Fellow. A Marshall Scholar and a Truman Scholar, Simpson holds degrees from the University of Chicago and the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. This afternoon, Ms. Simpson and I will have a conversation for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for questions in the second half of the hour. So you can please submit your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom uh, throughout, and we'll uh, bring in some of those towards the second half of the hour. So Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to be able to have this conversation with you. Ben, thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to be joining you in an hour. Great, awesome. Glad you don't have to make the trip up to our cold Ann Arbor days. So that's a good bonus for you. <laughs> so just to get us started off uh, and get everyone on the same page, could you provide a brief description of what digital contact tracing is and, how, and what exposure notification systems are, how they work and why are they so relevant in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, I can uh, be started with each of those things. Um, before I dive in, I just want to make one note, which is just sort of to honor those affected and acknowledge that this is um, not a technocratic story, even though, you know, we're having a conversation. This is, this is hard to talk about. Uh, people are suffering. The pandemic is ongoing and indeed I'm so much worse than when I proposed this topic in June. So even though, you know, we're talking about how exposure notification and digital contact tracing have played out in policy spaces, um, I just wanted to say that I hope our focus here is productive, not just as an intellectual exercise, but you know, in helping catalyze some reflection and understanding in order to address the pandemic more uh, effectively in the future. So just thanks and solidarity and support to everyone navigating this, and just to acknowledge up top that this is, this is about an ongoing crisis. Um, and so to your, to your excellent questions, so contact tracing itself and I'm not a public health expert, and so I speak, you know, with the utmost humility about the whole thing. But the traditional infectious disease response, uh, trained public health contact tracers, they're going to call you up and interview you if you test positive for an infectious disease, ask you where you've been and who you've seen, and then they're going to get in touch with everyone you've been in close contact with to help them uh, get care or isolate as appropriate. So. The idea is you're slowing the spread of disease by uh, tracing its spread and helping those people seek care. And digital contact tracing uh, was this idea that if we harnessed mobile phone capabilities, uh, we couldn't replicate the process of public health contact tracing, um, but there's something we could add 
uh, to the public health process by reducing the time between exposure and isolation. So if you, if you think back to, you know, what did we know about the coronavirus in March, um, you know, airborne pathogen, high levels of spread in asymptomatic people, up to two weeks, we were asking folks to report, you know, they may or may not show symptoms. And, and all of that together meant that you're, you're looking at a pathogen that's spreading really quickly. And early on, our public health team, you know, who was putting together recommendations around contact tracing, the vaccine, the whole lot. And they're saying, you know what, there are some real limits here. Um, no matter how much we ask states to staff up, and you might remember the John Hopkins Center for Health Security had a, we need to hire 100,000 contact tracers this summer. Um, and, and some states have met the bars that were set, you know, so incredible infrastructure investment. Um, but even with that, there were going to be, there are going to be some gaps. So um, one of them is speed. It just takes some time. Uh, one of them is uh, capacity. Um, once we enter levels of community spread, it's, it's really hard to do contact tracing. You don't even know where you got it. Um, and then there's an issue of anonymity. So the city bus problem is, is how we have sort of shorthanded it. You know, you get on a city bus and you don't know anyone else there. And so um, thinking about those gaps, in addition to all of the other measures, right? So, you know, mass testing, social and financial support to self-isolate, contact tracing, more resources, the whole kit and caboodle. People in the tech policy field were having a conversation of, is there anything else we could do? Because our, our public health experts are telling us that manual contact tracing isn't gonna do it. And we're looking to uh, places abroad that have uh, explored a lot of different ways to uh, make digitally capable public health response. Um, and then your last point, so exposure notification applications grew out of this question of uh, digital contact tracing. And when I talk about exposure notification systems today, I'm gonna be talking about the Apple and Google supported exposure notification system specifically. So this is a voluntary privacy preserving decentralized system using Bluetooth low energy technology. Um, in the shortest version of how it works, uh, it exchanges temporary anonymous IDs uh, with nearby phones who also have it enabled. So uh, my phone's gonna log those IDs of those around me, regular list of anonymous positive uh, temporary numbers, uh, match them on my own phone privately and let me know if uh, my private log of temporary numbers actually shows a log of an anonymous number that's tested positive. And so then, you know, that application can ask me to seek testing or self-isolate. And then if I do end up testing positive, you know, I can share that I've tested positive and it starts the cycle over in terms of helping people pull those numbers down and, and notify privately. And so this was, you know, it was the name of digital contact tracing was a little misleading. Um, you know, this is not a version of what public health workers were doing at all. Um, it was a, a tool that individuals were using to protect themselves and their community. Um, and my team was involved really early since the beginning and sort of um, trying to support this process in the United States, uh, trying to help lift up recommendations of great university teams and uh, other nations who were with us, and then helping draft privacy legislation at a federal level around those. And so as of November 24th, 16 states and territories plus DC um, are supporting exposure notification. So um, in just a short amount of time, it's uh, gone from a twinkle in the eye to very much real. Wow. So this is this is a, as many of the responses have been this year, a rapid pace effort. And I particularly like your emphasis on this being in addition to everything else. So often we want to talk about, you know, here's this technology, it can solve this problem, that alone is going to do it. And I appreciate the emphasis on this is just one piece of the puzzle in addition to everything else. Uh, so you gave us a little bit of the preview of what you mean when you're what the actual infrastructures are when you talk about exposure notification and the number of states that have already started implementing something. So let's go back to, you know, around the spring when the pandemic was starting and these conversations were starting and we were trying to figure out how to do some of this. What were some of the pressing, you know, technical questions, but in addition, the social, political and policy questions that had to be addressed and asked before we could actually get something going? Mm. In March, I think just about everything was a question. Uh, but I'll give you my, my top five in each category there. Um, so first, there was a question about Bluetooth at all. Uh, most people are familiar with Bluetooth as like having their headphones not connect. And it was not at all designed to measure distance, especially between two, uh, only two points. So Bluetooth questions, there were crypto questions. Could we get to a privacy design that was 
going to be good enough. Uh, their interoperability questions, both between Apple and Google, had uh, Bluetooth handshakes working a little differently, and then also how are we going to do this between states? Uh, in the U.S., we have a really decentralized public health system at the state or sometimes at the county level. And so how are we going to push a system um, that actually works with people moving around? Um, fourth, testing integration and verification. People were really freaked out early on about you could abuse the system by having a false positive. I say I test positive. I didn't. I really mess up my neighbor's day, et cetera, et cetera. So testing integration with state systems, and five, um, calibration of the epi algorithm, the epidemiological algorithm. So we're still learning about the coronavirus, but how close, for how long did I need to be to you? Was it six feet? How do we make six feet in Bluetooth terms? So there's a lot going on there um, in open source GitHubs um, and academic teams around the world sort of trying to work on those questions. And then simultaneously, um, as we were looking about this, you know, from our specific US context, we are thinking about, you know, first surveillance. Um, so uh, we have a history of expanding government surveillance powers during crises in this country. So thinking about the Patriot Act after 9-11. Um, and we also have really disproportionate surveillance targeting communities. Uh, so thinking about the HIV AIDS crisis and public health surveillance of people with HIV AIDS during the 80s. Thinking about federal surveillance of civil rights processes during the 60s. Um, there's a really long history of uh, distrust sort of rightfully earned from the government. And so we're thinking about surveillance powers and we're thinking about how that history is coming in to deal with public trust. Two, I mean, just broader civil rights and equity concerns. Um, so the disparate impact of the virus is, is already a problem on communities of color, on the disability community, um, on working people and people without healthcare. And so are we designing a system that's helping to ameliorate those disparate impacts? Or are we using our technology to just compound those things? Is this only gonna work for you know, like white teenagers who have iPhone 7s, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's uh, sort of traditional civil rights concerns. So about public accommodation. Um, could you be forced into using these? Could I be forced to show you that I don't have a, an exposure before I head into work or something? Um, how could it be used in that way? And then there were also sort of, uh, you know, governance and oversight concerns and concerns about private company involvement more broadly. So we had, a, we had a lot to deal with. And on top of that, we had the, the number one political concern of just no federal leadership in this space and, and not really a desire to want to uh, solve the pandemic and be working on the pandemic. So mm -hmm. there were a lot of questions in the beginning. <laughs> so it seems like you had your hands pretty full. Uh, so I think you know, one, of the, one of the major questions that, that people sort of started thinking about with this was these questions of privacy, both it, from the perspective of the technical infrastructure and design of the system, but also how it would connect to systems of surveillance. Uh, and, and particularly during the course of a summer where we were both in lockdown trying to build these systems and thinking about them, but also mass protests across the US for the Black Lives Matter movement it, against police brutality and police surveillance. So, so how, did, how did these policy and technical elements interact and how did the sort of policy questions and the concerns about privacy shape the technical debates that you were having or that researchers were having into guiding the types of systems that ended up being designed? Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. And, and you draw really the, the perfect um, contrast between like, are we really going to ask people to let us track them when we are trying to go to protests and being, you know, uh, tracked by the police in, in all kinds of different ways. The concern was really manifest when there was an official in Minnesota who, um, in response to um, the, the protests against the police killing of George Floyd, are, are saying, uh, oh yeah, we're, we're contact tracing all of the protesters. We're gonna figure out where they're come from. We do it just like we're contact tracing the coronavirus. And that, I mean, that, that, that encapsulates um, sort of exactly some of the historical fears and the present fears in, well, this is why, you know, we, we don't know if we wanna be digitally enabling public health response. Mm -hmm. um, so for our team being deeply concerned about that, working with our race and ethnicity team and our disability justice team from the beginning, um, you know, even under tough circumstances, we knew that the, the risks around surveillance and around um, law enforcement or ICE access to this data um, were really high. 
uh, with, with this kind of data, you know, you could recreate the, the social graph essentially. So where I've been and, and who I've seen, um, even if you're not using GPS data, even with Bluetooth, we pushed um, from very early on to go to a decentralized system. Um, and so this is, um, you know, we're never federating all the codes that all the phones have seen at once. We're, you know, we're pulling things to our phone um, and we're matching there. And that, that meant a lot of things technically um, and for public health. And so technically, um, you know, we were looking at the decentralized privacy preserving proximity tracing project, DP3T, uh, which was um, a, a big open source collaboration out of uh, Europe led by Dr. Carmela Trancoso. Um, and that was really the first thing we'd seen that said, oh, this, this could work in a totally decentralized way. Um, and, and the beauty of that is there isn't a centralized database to subpoena. Uh, if you're trying to arrest someone, it's not a centralized database to hack into in terms of a security risk. Uh, you're just getting a bunch of, of random numbers that aren't going to mean anything to you. And so that doesn't completely eliminate privacy risk, but that was the first hurdle for us in terms of even considering something. Um, it just, it just wasn't going to, especially during with the federal administration we had and everything that was going on. Um, you know, we, we had to have something that was safe for people. And the, the, um, the burden that then fell on us was to really argue for that um, in a powerful way to public health authorities who were the decision makers here. And so, you know, we were first arguing that this, uh, there's not a tension between privacy and public health because at the end of the day, you're, these, are, these should be voluntary systems and it would be really hard to make them mandatory. And so the only way these can succeed is to make something worthy of trust because people are going to have to want to download it. The only way to do that is to do this hyper privacy sensitive, anonymous, decentralized design. And so that sounds really good. But then you get into these conversations deeper with public health officials and I'm, rightly so, you know, they're, they're managing in a crisis and they're saying, we don't have eyes on the problem. We don't have the data we need. You're telling me we're going to invest in an entire clinical system around public health data and we're not going to be able to have a dashboard or useful metrics and also there's not there, you can't tell me if it's going to work and so there were real um, tensions there um, and i don't mean to be dismissive of those i think coming from the tech policy side it was easy for us to say yes we want an anonymous decentralized system of course um, and then uh but but really having to to argue that we do think that's best for public health because there's just no other way. Um, and, and we understand that that's hard to invest in right now because your teams are scrambling for resources and it would be great to have more data. Um, and, and a lot of folks you know, come into this conversation thinking about um, South Korea's system of public health, which is extremely extensive, developed during SARS and MERS. So, you know, tested for federating financial data, transportation data, um, all kinds of, they have a really comprehensive view of things. And so it, it was hard to walk into those conversations, having that be people's point of reference sometimes in terms of what they hoped they were getting from these systems. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's a great example of how our broader systems of, of governance and particularly these histories of policing and surveillance really shape what we can and can't do when it comes to data collection. As, as someone who studies uh, smart cities, there are so many cases where technology has been or data has been collected and it's supposed to curb congestion or improve public health and just the natural gravity where it gets pulled into being used to track protesters or investigate cases or all of that, such that data that in a certain system could potentially be useful, the fears of it being used for racially unjust surveillance and enforcement mean that it's not worth the risk. So we can, you know, it's an interesting case of how maybe in a different system, we could collect some of this data in a different way, but given the reality of our present, uh, you know, city governments and local, local governments and how these data collection and sharing systems work, suddenly that becomes uh, very difficult, if not impossible to be worth it. Um, and so you mentioned working on, as one of your other major efforts, then privacy legislation. So you had, you were having these conversations, you had a system in mind. How did you ultimately convince legislators about what they, about, you know, this was the right way to go? And what is, what did the process of drafting that legislation uh, look like? And where, where does that legislation stand? 
Mm, that legislation uh, stands uh, introduced and in committee and not passed. Um, but uh, legislators were concerned um, early on uh, about these systems. I mean, they're, they're concerned about the public health crisis. And um, a lot of our sort of privacy champions in Congress were also concerned about coronavirus privacy. And while I don't lose sleep over the exposure notification systems um, that are popular now, that state public health systems run, Apple and Google run, there's a proliferation of other systems, private systems, systems that universities are requiring, systems that workplaces are, are requiring that are extremely privacy invasive. And so the idea legislatively was to lay down a baseline um, under which uh, that to make all systems safe, um, even if uh, you, you were departing from our desired design. Um, and so our congressional engagement like that sort of worked on two tracks. I mean, first we worked with um, a broad coalition of other civil rights and advocacy organizations um, to in partnership with the Leadership Conference and others draft a civil rights principles for coronavirus for the Senate letter. And so just laying down um, really the, uh, the technology in use problems, the non-discrimination and public uh, public accommodation protections we wanted, the voluntariness, um, and the the purpose limitation, especially. And so, um, you know, at the federal level, you're thinking about how do we uh, how do we restrict this purpose to public health? How far can we legally go to protect it from um, ever getting to? ICE or law enforcement or intelligence communities and places we don't want this data to go because we're collecting it for um, public health and we've got uh, issues with sharing it. And, um, and so we, we, know we, we put forward that letter and, and those coalition processes are, are tough and they're great because when you're able to, to synthesize all of these groups are behind these principles, um, that's good. And then there were two Senate teams who were working on uh, different um, sort of scopes of coronavirus privacy legislation. Um, if we had federal privacy legislation in the U.S., none of this would have been necessary. We would have maybe had great baselines already. Um, but instead, you know, we were working with uh, a lot of really smart Senate staffers um, from Senator Blumenthal's office, Senator Cantwell's office, Senator Markey's office, um, just on trying to ensconce uh, what is the right baseline, what are employers going to try to do, um, what are the tough edge cases where uh, there might be legitimate reasons you would need something to happen. Uh, that other that broadly like you're really worried about um and so really just pushing for purpose limitation voluntariness mm -hmm. non-discrimination so that even if somebody goes out and makes a horribly privacy invasive app uh, it can't be abused in the ways we're most worried about it being abused um of course that legislation uh, doesn't move forward um because we you know we don't have the power in the senate to move things forward right now so mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so how, how does that seem to be, you know, what's on the horizon then as we have uh, a transition happening both at the presidential level, Congress changing, potentially the state of Congress uh, up for grabs next month, you know, where do you see that legislation or other efforts around exposure notification going politically as we, as we move into uh, a new administration? Yeah, I, um, I, I, won't, I won't speculate um, um, uh, what the new administration will do or what Congress will do, but I know what I hope will happen. Um, and I think that's what many people hope will happen regardless of your party affiliation, which is just um, a coordinated serious federal response to the pandemic. Um, you know, as, as I said at the beginning, digital contact tracing is kind of the last thing on top of um, deep investment in our healthcare infrastructure and testing and tracing and the vaccine and financial support so people can actually stay home safely and everything else. Um, and then yes, uh, we would love to see sort of federal support behind what has thus far been, you know, really scrappy state support to get these systems set up and working with Apple and Google getting things set up. Um, we've seen a lot of success in other places that have um, federal support, say, Germany, I think they've now reached 20 million. They were 18 and a half earlier this fall. So 20 million users, that's amazing. We've had over 5,000 people um, get notifications that they were exposed and, and get tested that they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm just looking forward to um, an actual serious federal policy response from mm -hmm. the administration. Um, and hopefully uh, Congress will move on coronavirus relief as well because, um, no state is going to be able to spend any time on this, even if the cost is negligible, if they don't have the, the bread and butter funding 
to federate their county level contact tracer databases, which is, you know, mm -hmm. something they, a lot of, they had to work on for months, uh, a lot of states early this summer. So mm -hmm. um, plenty to do. Yeah, very hopeful for 2021 um, and understanding that that'll be a serious issue. Great. So, so we'll be jumping to audience questions soon. So just a reminder to put those into the chat and we'll try to get as many of those in. Uh, in just maybe about five minutes or so, we'll make that transition. Um, so, so Aaron, one thing you've mentioned a couple times is the role of Apple and Google in all of this. So, what did that look like, and you know, how how do you feel about the role that they've been playing uh, in this whole process? <laughs> oh, it's so complicated. Um, <laughs> I mean, grateful um, that they made. A, a responsible decision to, um, you know, really embrace privacy protections around this system and then make it available worldwide under what is um, basically as good as we could have hoped. You know, this is, it's so rare that you put out a policy prescription and uh, it actually comes to fruition exactly as, as you'd hoped, but it was truly sort of one of the best systems we could have imagined um, from the open source work that was going on. And so, you know, credit where credit is due in terms of teams at Apple and Google, um, although the initial announcement was a bit of a surprise, um, getting into the fray, taking a lot of feedback on the spec really quickly, being really communicative um, with mm -hmm. different uh, technologist teams who are working on this and with different states, uh, making changes early on. Um, you know, they've really evolved to make it super easy for state adoption. And so I credit them with all of that. Also, um, you know, it's, it, I shouldn't have to feel grateful that they're making responsible privacy decisions there. Um, you know, we should have uh, public uh, regulatory baselines that make ensure that, you know, we don't have to hope that Apple and Google do the right thing, that they can do it. And, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of public involvement. We, you know, federal leadership was out to lunch, obviously, or all golfing. Um, but it, they, they made the de facto international standard for contact tracing kind of immediately. And, and I'm glad that it's good. Um, but I don't know what will happen next time. Um, and it, it reflects poorly on our public infrastructure that we weren't out front and that we didn't have something ready and something that we were sort of leading with or engaging with um, as other nations were, which is sad. And so it's an interesting example of the power of that uh, mobile operating system duopoly. Um, it's a really pro-social use of it, I think. And I you know, give those teams so much credit. Uh, and it also, I think, reflects in a kind of disturbing, eerie way in the back of all of our heads in terms of just the, the immense power, even if used for good, uh, that is held there. Right, right. How much we are left up to their decisions as these giant unelected companies to make really massive public health decisions uh, in terms of privacy, health, all of that. Um, so yeah, so turning to the future, uh, right, we've been about maybe nine months in the real thick of it in the United States. As you think about the next nine to 12 months, we obviously have, we're in the middle of a really bad wave. There's some promising news about vaccines, it's, but it's going to take a long time until things are back to normal. So, and, and now we actually have these exposure notification systems starting to really be rolled out, come online. We know a little bit more about them. So what do you see their role being over this next year? Uh, and what's maybe your greatest hope and your greatest fear about what will happen with these systems as we navigate really this next phase or two of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, after all of the other public health interventions, you know, have listed off, I, I really do think at the back of the line, this is another tool to help protect people, protect themselves and protect their communities and add another layer of protection. People are talking about the Swiss cheese model in terms of the public health interventions we need. I think this is another slice of Swiss cheese um, that can also help, uh, maybe help with some of those speed gaps and those anonymity gaps that we talked about. Um, especially once we leave community spread, uh, you know, there's an opportunity theoretically to help us reopen more safely and to curb outbreaks more quickly because people are sort of reducing that time between getting infected and self-isolating. Uh, my greatest hope is that that happens. <laughs> that would be my greatest hope. And um, my greatest fear, you know, especially because legislation hasn't passed on this um, and I don't lose sleep over, you know, the main Apple Google exposure notification system, but I do others. So, you know, I mm -hmm. do 
I, my greatest fear is that uh, those civil liberties abuses come to fruition, um, either from a surveillance perspective or a public accommodations perspective. Um, and uh, history's full of those examples. So uh, I think that's a, that's a justified fear. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's jump into some of the questions from the audience. Uh, so to get started, you mentioned the absence of privacy legislation in the United States. How does the approach to digital contact tracing in the US uh, contrast with countries covered by the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR in the European, European, European Union? Uh, were digital contact tracing programs even possible there and what do they look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we got to talk to Germany's team a couple of times over the summer while they were developing theirs. And they described their challenge as 75% uh, communication and 25% technical. And their communication was um, working a lot with their uh, government privacy agency, um, in addition to government health agencies, et cetera, because they had to get GDR approval off the bat. Um, you know, they had to make sure their design was in compliance. They did that in advance. Um, and so uh, they did advance and they set up validators um, within the government, outside of the government, we set up validators in the open source community and the privacy community. Um, and they tried to get everyone on board beforehand because public trust is so fragile in these things um, that they didn't want it to be ruined. And so, uh, yes, systems possible under GDPR um, and even really successful. I think Germany is one of the most widely used um, at this point. And so, um, and they'll also be federating their uh, <laughs> privacy preserving exposure notification applications uh, very soon across Europe. And so um, not a barrier. And indeed, I think probably an accelerant, uh, just because if you do have baseline privacy protections, and that's something you're accustomed to as a public right, um, maybe you have a little less trepidation about mm -hmm. your privacy concerns, uh, like we do in the US, where it's just normal corporate practice to have a horrible, but you know, the bar is so low, like why would mm -hmm. we trust anything after how we're treated every day? And so, um, yeah, that, that's a good question. If you uh, find any issues, you should let me know. <laughs> and, and on that theme, what were some of the, you know, as you look across globally at other examples, what are some of the, uh, you know, other types of systems that other countries are doing, whether in the EU or in Asia that maybe are, are quite different due to the nature of how their laws and institutions are set up? Yeah, um, uh, a lot of, uh, I should say first, you know, a lot of countries are on the exposure notification system by Apple and Google now, just because it's a, a, a near duopoly on mobile operating mm -hmm. systems globally. So that's become really easy to roll out. But before that, um, you know, there, there were several countries that were real leaders around, okay, we're gonna use technology as a part of public health. Um, I mentioned South Korea um, and sort of the really detailed system they had there in terms of, you know, federating the financial records, transportation records, uh, this, that, and the other thing. You know, they got a lot of attention for uh, letting people know when there was an exposure near them, which I think uh, strike a lot of people the wrong way here, but um, it's, mm -hmm. it's really hard to make comparisons. Um, obviously, China had a, a very sophisticated system of tracking and monitoring, and they had uh, like the codes that you had to show to get into public buildings. So I think sketching out some of what, what we would perceive as public accommodations concerns. Um, Singapore deserves a lot of credit for going out with Bluetooth uh, early. So they were really trying to figure out whether the Bluetooth thing could work. And they actually had um, teams of professional contact tracers um, uh, on the back end. So, you know, it wasn't this distributed automatic system where you had to upload things yourself. They were doing a lot of that and they were sharing their lessons, which I think was really appreciated. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of countries that are exploring different systems. Um, and at some point, you know, all of these teams are really busy. So they're not doing a lot of uh, publishing for the rest of the policy or academic community on how things are going. But um, I'm really looking forward to sort of seeing the, the deep dives in terms of what worked and what doesn't um, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have some really interesting retrospectives after the fact as we can analyze both the different types of systems and the different types of institutions and how they made these different mm -hmm. systems possible or effective. And you know, the app that might work in South Korea is very different than the app that might work in the United States. And I think there's really interesting comparisons to draw there. Yeah, um, I mean, people were so 
concerned, I think, about uh, like civil rights or the privacy stuff, and that's true. But the most boring consideration is just, oh, yeah, they, they have an effective and, and um, effective, federated, robust, centralized public health system, and we have county level public health administration, and um, there's you know, more than 3,000 counties in the United States. So it's just technically not possible. Like the first concern I have is like, oh, it's, it's mundane, but there's no way uh, we can't even get close. So yeah, right. it's it's going to be. Um, hopefully, there's a lot we can learn going forward. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so so one of the questions is about how employers are maybe using digital contact tracing apps for their employees. Uh, so are there examples of cases where this is happening? Are employees forced to download these apps? Uh, and what kinds of civil liberties issue concerns arise? And how do these apps compare that employers are using for their uh, workers uh, when it comes to equity, privacy, security, and so on to the Google Apple uh, system that you've been talking about? Yeah, it's, um, it's a walking civil liberties disaster, uh, I think it's pretty safe to say. Um, there are, I mean, just, so just to sketch it out, I mean, to, to have your employer be able to, some of these apps are location-based, so, you know, your locations and where you've been or who you're associating with, um, there's not oversight on these applications. So one, we don't even know if they work, so they could be um, abused to discriminate in other ways. Um, and two, they could be abused to discriminate on whether or not you have coronavirus or have been exposed to someone with coronavirus, et cetera. Um, and so there's, it's, it's easy to imagine um, how uh, challenging that could be and how that's disproportionately going to be used against um, low-income workers and against people of color, um, because that is how our system is set up when we do manipulative surveillance programs. And so, you know, our civil rights letter and our privacy legislation would have made it really clear that the systems have to be voluntary and that you can't abuse them in that way. Um, and, you know, it's still a concern even then, you just have the ability to bring uh, litigation to, you know, challenge that and get redress. Um, so it's, you know, it's an open issue now. We don't have eyes on a lot of examples. Um, there are some great journalists who are looking into this and who are looking really closely, um, especially we're thinking about warehouse workers, the ways in which they're already surveilled and how this will be mm -hmm. sort of enmeshed into those systems. Um, there's some troubling university examples um, in terms mm -hmm. of universities mandating uh, apps to be downloaded and then having those apps to be super privacy invasive or just not very pure, not active. Um, and so hopefully in the next Congress, address those issues by putting down a baseline uh, above which those systems have to meet technically um, and use wise and, and give them some real civil liberties oversight. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that'll probably be a, a priority given just sort of how the new administration is talking about the crisis of the pandemic and the crisis of racial justice. You know, this is a crisis in both senses. So um, I'm optimistic that that will be addressed. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's not just then, you know, this raises is it's not just 3000 or more than 3000 counties, it's also a bunch of employers who might be rolling out systems, mm -hmm. it's a bunch of universities, which are one of the I think the main other types of institutions that are rolling out various types of systems. And right, I think you can imagine both which types of employers are more likely to have these systems and given the, the, the sort of racial dif the differences in terms of which communities and how hard it, the pandemic is hitting black and brown communities, you know, if it raises these rights, these sort of issues of public access and being able to go to work, uh, what's going to happen and who's going to be able to show up to, to work or who's going to be fired yeah. or any of those sorts of questions Absolutely. are really severe. Yeah, yeah, the economic crisis as well. And just to say sort of like an interesting um, like policy note there. It's just like the strongest policy or just, you know, you can just ban straight prohibitions. And as soon as you mm -hmm. start kind of tinkering around the edges or making exceptions, those can be exploited. And so the trick for us there is, as we were talking about this rule legislatively, we're like, can we just ban it or do we have to make exceptions? You know, because you can think of like, okay, well, what's the edge case where an employer should be able to say, well, if you got a negative test, you have to, you know, you're not allowed to come into work or something, you know, is it medical workers or is there something there? Um, and that, make, that can get really complicated because it's easy to raise those hypotheticals um, and sort of really quickly dilute like a good intention, strong rule into something that's easily exploited. Mm -hmm. so, right. And so a lot of this clearly then relies on, you know, it's voluntary use. Clearly, mm -hmm. there's a lot of reliance on, on trust here on, yeah. in a lot of directions, but particularly ultimately trust among people 
to download this app and have it on their phone. Um, so one question would be then, do we know, uh, you know, do we have any demographic information in terms of who's likely to download and use these apps and what the uptake is generally and how this might be, you know, ranging across populations, across any number of uh, demographic categories? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, our answer is no, um, as we don't, we know we, we didn't system that would collect any of that information. Um, you have to study that kind of information completely outside of the system you've built. So, you know, all people are getting is downloads, monthly active users, codes validated for positive tests um, and codes shared. That's pretty Spartan. Um, so the German team actually is doing like a public health study on top of it, where they're just like at testing sites, like asking people if they got the notification and that's why they came in. So that's kind of the level we're at right now. They are going to be publishing some of those conclusions, which we're looking forward to. Um, there, but that being said, um, you know, from the beginning, you know, this is 75% of communications challenge that so people were thinking about, okay, well, who's least likely to trust us, the government, um, and thinking uh, proactively about um, the disability concerns, the accessibility concerns within this, um, the multilingual concerns, um, concerns about people who, uh, people, you know, it's like older adults a lot, maybe as not being as familiar with some of this technology. And so, you know, state, a lot of places did dedicated campaigns. And so Colorado, they described theirs as like a Netflix style launch where they, they're like, yeah, we just, you know, for like three days, we tried to get it everywhere we could get it. And then we launched it. But they also like, you know, they, they talked a lot about a program reaching out to clergy and faith leaders and mm. trying to reach older populations and populations of color who might not be willingly ready to trust the public health system based on really reasonable um, examples throughout history. And so uh, I think people are being sensitive about it. Like they know this is a communications issue. They know they need um, multilingual communication and that anywhere where they think there's going to be less use, that's where they have to be proactive. And so at least we've seen, I think, a lot of thought go into that thus far. Mm -hmm. and, and how does this ultimately play out in terms of the efficacy of the system? I mean, certainly the more people you have who are using it or have it on their phones, you imagine the more helpful it'll actually be. I mean, what are there target numbers that you shoot for? Or how do you think about what success would look like and how to make sure that we're able to hit those numbers uh, given the voluntariness and the messaging and the trust challenges? Yes, well, as we argued, you know, the only way you're gonna get to that road of trust uh, is through uh, privacy and making it voluntary, which is of course uh, the paradox there because there is more to do and there is more to commit to. But early on, um, there was an Oxford team that put out a study on 60% is what they thought you needed to be epide epidemiologically meaning curve and break um, as its own thing. And there are this summer to say, even if you get 15% of the population, um, that you're going to be starting to see meaningful public health uh, reductions um, in spread, which uh, would be incredible. So 15% is a much more uh, achievable target, I think. And, mm -hmm. you know, to be, to be clear, any reduction in, in spread is totally worth it. And so when states are starting to publish numbers of how many testing codes have been claimed, it's only a couple hundred people. We don't know what happened, but even if it's only a couple hundred people, you know, this is, this is spreading exponentially. And so I think there is a lot of interest there. Um, early numbers from states that are releasing this fall have been great. You know, so Colorado reached almost 17% of the population in the first week. That was incredible. Wow. Germany, almost at 20 million people now. Um, so that's a significant part of the population that is over 18 and has a cell phone. Um, and you know, even if you're not participating, if we're able to reduce community spread in any way, that does benefit everyone. Um, and so we're not worried that the benefits are only accrued to people who are participating. You know, we do think benefits can accrue broadly. We're trying to right. spread less. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot to fit in to public health messaging, frankly, because the more important things are, you know, the guidelines we've all been told in terms of social distancing and washing your hands, and staying home, and, and those are being updated. So there's a lot to keep up with already. The challenge for teams working on exposure notification has been to cut through, but um, even low numbers, I think we're excited about. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Every, every case reduced helps yeah. both for yourself and for the people that you could be infecting down the line uh, who yeah. may not have ever had the app or heard of it. Mm -hmm. So Exactly. Right. 
So, so when we're talking about this conversation of trust and privacy, it sort of sounds a lot like how we think about uh, privacy a lot in the digital world of, you know, you have to, you sign up, you click the box, you give consent uh, for, for whatever the, you know, service or app might, might involve. Um, but of course, people, you know, true consent really requires knowledge of the full risks and benefits mm -hmm. of, the cons of consenting to the technology. Uh, and in many ways, the benefits and harms in this case are, are unknown. It's hard to know what that will actually look like. Um, and so do you think this is a, is a flaw in these systems? And how can we think about really making sure that uh, the trust and the consent that people are giving when they sign up is, is robust and that they're really educated uh, about what they're what they're doing, or do you think that's you know not even maybe the right framing for for how we think about trust in this setting? No, I think that's a very astute question. Um, consent broadly in privacy legislation, consent based models um, are really limited just in terms of the burden it puts on individuals, and um, when really it's a you know it's like a collective or it's a public burden that we should be taking on. Um, in this instance, because we, you know, we push for voluntary and decentralized, um, you're putting, you're choosing to put a lot of onus on the user. Um, and you heard my like, you know, best attempt at the short version up top of what this does. And so, you know, mm -hmm. trying to put that into, um, you know, as plain language as you can for people. I think uh, there are some, you know, user experience content writers out there who've been doing uh, an amazing job and a much better job than I have at giving it a shot. Um, but in this case for these teams, like, uh, the best practices um, in the private sector are not enough here. And so a lot of these apps will have sort of extensive walk systems um, that like try to give you the best shot. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I, this person raises great concerns. Like, you know, do we really know the risks? Like, do we really know the efficacy? Like, no, there's some uncertainty here. Um, but also we're not measuring those in a vacuum, we're measuring them against the risks and the uncertainty around the pandemic. And so even in my, you know, just tech policy brain was like, ah, I'm not sure, you know, that, that is a limitation. Um, it's, it's only with the broader context of saying, but, you know, you know, we're doing this, we have tried to poke holes in these systems as much as we can. We push for the strongest possible stuff. You know, we're hoping to get a regulatory baseline soon. We're pretty confident. Um, relative to the the risk and the emergency here, so I don't know if we've got it right. Um, I, I don't know if we'll ever know. Hopefully, uh, there'll be some great criticism uh, in the coming year as things subside. But um, yeah, it was an interesting example of just trying to make that calculation on limited information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, you know, as as you're going through this process, one thing I'm curious about is what it looked like to have all of the different teams, both in your organization and beyond really working together. You mentioned a bunch of civil rights groups and racial justice groups. You have your technology and public health teams. What was it like trying in rapid pace to work across this incredible range of disciplines and organizations? And you know, are there any particular uh, conversations or insights that particularly surprised you where you said, wow, you know, it's so important that we had not just the engineers in the room, but also this other group, because I never would have thought of, uh, you know, this factor or this concern. So what was that actual working process like? Mm. Yeah, I think it really goes both ways. Um, I remember first, you know, we having come up with sort of the best uh, possible system we could technically and then talking about governance wise, and again, not us coming up with, but other teams coming up with brilliant mm -hmm. ideas and us trying to recommend those. Um, you know, doing a meeting with civil rights lawyers um, and a labor policy analyst saying, you know, what are the worker surveillance problems? How could this be abused? And just having people be able to come up with so many instances right off the bat. And even if you design a privacy perfect system, the cryptography is beautiful. There's no way anything could go wrong. It's zero trust. Um, it can totally be abused as soon as it's out there. Um, and there are so many um, disturbing ways that uh, people brought up in which um, that a lot of them with historical examples in terms of ways these could be abused in practice, even if mm -hmm. um, what's on your phone is really, really strong. Um, and then honestly, just that initial calculation with our health policy team um, and sort of having them sort of lay it out for us in terms of we, we might need this. This could get really, really bad. Um, we're trying to get all options on the table um, and having a lot, you know, 
your gut reaction, I think, to the first idea of this is, oh, you're going to make an app for coronavirus tracking? You're like, oh, technosolutionism, the surveillance, this is going to be horrible. And I think we had to come to it a little bit reluctantly, honestly, mm-hmm. just because, you know, we kept getting challenged to say, you know, we're like, yeah, well, surveillance disproportionately affects Black and brown communities we really care about. And having health and be like, yeah, the pandemic is disproportionately affecting Black and brown communities we really care about. And so we need to, like, really really be real here about what we think the risks are and trying to to like you know talk through uncertainty and risks um, that are that high stakes um intention you know it was great to be able to do that with an interdisciplinary perspective instead of just the tech policy perspective because were i working on just a tech policy team i think it would have been easier to just continue putting out um uh here are all of my concerns and instead i had to put out here's how I think we can overcome these concerns based on the emergency that is presented to us. Um, and that was a mm-hmm. really interesting, I mean, it was, a, it was a challenge. Yeah, it was a really, uh, it was a challenging time. So what's interesting here is that it's almost the opposite of what you imagine almost, you know, 99% of these types of situations going like, because it's actually you as the tech team that's reluctant because you're thinking about a lot of the risks. And then it sounds like it's a lot of the, public health and other groups who are recognizing the risks of not doing something and a nice way where if you have everyone concerned about all of the types of risks, you might actually be able to to do something effective uh, rather than, you know, being very gung ho and thinking that, well, this will be this will be amazing. It's only by having everyone raise all the possible risks. But in this case, it was actually the tech folks who are the most reluctant to build something, uh, which is really interesting. Well, it's great to work on a progressive technology policy team. Uh, it's uh, it's a it's a refreshing employment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so as these systems are are rolled out, one question then is, you know, how how are they effective at different points in mm-hmm. maybe a community spread or at different points in a wave? Or is it, you know, better when community transi- transition transmission rates are, are high or is it more effective when things are more under control? Is it, you know, sort of differentiate across different sort of levels of spread in the pandemic? Yeah, um, in my humble public health understanding here, um, based on traditional contact tracing, there's a point in community spread at which um, it, there's just too much to trace. Um, and it's too difficult and you're behind and it's a lot. And I think some of those problems hold um, with digital contact tracing as well. Um, not that you know you can't have, have really speedy notifications, but uh, the other parts of the system are overburdened. So the testing is overburdened or the healthcare system itself is overburdened. Um, and so you're not able to actually you know, follow through on self isolate like getting tested and self isolating. Like that's what makes it, you know, good. The knowledge is good in and of itself, but really you need to test and, and you need to stay home and you need sports to stay home. Um, so my understanding is after community spread, when we're out of community spread or when we're leaving, that this, this could be of more use um, just because the systems, the public health systems are in place and they would be able to handle it. But also, you know, say once we're reopening, the hope is that um, this could help catch an outbreak earlier um Mm. if you know if we're still thinking about a two-week delay and i know we're thinking about it a little shorter now but just thinking about you know how quickly an outbreak could spread um just within those days um is is really scary and so if if we all are using exposure notification and participating in public health contact tracing there's a chance that together you know public health contact tracers can be strategic about finding the places that are really the super spreaders or you know Mm -hmm. where people are gathering and that um, the exposure notification systems kind of catch the long tail and encourage people to be staying home. Also, this doesn't really work for healthcare workers uh, mm. who are in contact every day. Uh, we should always be asterisking that. That's one population which is probably not great for. Mm-hmm. So as you think about the different dynamics for developing these systems and the rules, you know, how do you think of the, the dynamics between different groups and which are there ones that you think are particularly powerful across the federal government, uh, technology companies, advocacy groups, political parties, how, you know, how are they all fitting together? And, you know, as the rest of us are thinking about ways to know what's going on or, or actually support and promote or advocate for better better outcomes? You know, who should we be looking to? Who should we be uh, calling or talking to or putting pressure on across these groups uh, to, to hope, help us get to better outcomes? 
Mm. Well, in terms of the first question, you know, I think uh, having uh, the administrative state fully activated to respond to the pandemic, to have federal leadership, I think a lot of states are ready for federal funding and federal leadership around these issues. So, um, you know, we're, we know the coming administration is taking that seriously. And so, you know, looking to that, um, looking to effective public health messaging. Um, the CDC has been doing public health modernization efforts um, for, you know, many years now. Um, but those are still pretty divorced and separate from the kinds of systems we're talking about when it comes to exposure notification realistically. So it'll be really interesting to see um, how that conversation moves forward. Um, in Michigan, um, as of last month, you have an exposure notification application. So, you know, I encourage you all to uh, go ahead and stress test that and look under the hood and, you know, call the team and, and definitely point out, give them feedback. Uh, there's a really hard digital services team somewhere uh, really working on this, but I have good hopes for that. Um, in terms of people to follow and related work, uh, you can volunteer with the US Digital Response if you're a technologist to public health person wants to lend their skills. The Linux Foundation um, for Public Health has been doing incredible work on this. They absorbed the Temporary Contact Number Coalition, which is a lot of the US groups leading work on this, and they're great. Um, obviously, a lot of this started on GitHub and is still continuing there. So you can go look at DP3T and like their initial ethics review and, and try to figure out um, how this developed for yourself. But um, really excited for policy leadership on this. Um, and obviously we're talking about um, continued CARES packages, so continued coronavirus relief packages. Um, and eventually I think we'd like to see this sort of acknowledged and supported from the federal level there. Mm -hmm. And so maybe just then one quick last question, as you mentioned, uh, support, you know, the CARES package, how, you know, how can we ensure that these systems can ultimately be effective so that people can have the proper mechanisms to isolate, to get tested, all of that. I mean, that seems incredibly essential that people actually be able to do something when they get that notification that they mm -hmm. may have been exposed. Yeah, people can actually stay home if they need money to pay rent to uh, stay in their homes. And so the idea that we don't have financial support, I would rather have financial support and free testing um, and a really affordable healthcare for people to be able to do that. And so we should be pushing all of those things. I would support a CARES package with all of those things with no technology support 100 times out of 100. Um, and there are ways to integrate the systems as well. So Colorado um, has a great thing where if you have an exposure notification alert that you may have been exposed, that is sufficient for you and your employer to receive benefits for you to get paid to stay home. Mm -hmm. And so um, programs like that, that are integrating these into giving away social and financial support that's needed to actually have people stay home, which is the point, um, that's great. And that's really encouraging to see. And I hope I see more of that um, because that's what people ultimately need. Uh, the app is useless without uh, sort of the social and the money support to stay home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, that brings us to time perfectly. Aaron, thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about, a lot to do, um, and a lot to think about moving forward and these interesting intersections of technology and public policy. Um, so I really want to thank you for that. Um, for everyone else, just two final reminders. As I said at the top, uh, if you're interested in the graduate certificate program for STPP, you can, the next deadline is March 1st for the application and our next STPP webinar will be on Monday, February 8th at 4 p.m. And information about both of those are in the chat. So thank you all. Thank you again, Aaron, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. And thanks to Molly, Sujin, Amanda, and of course, Shabita. Stay safe.